I don't know about you, but sometimes it's hard for me to be what I'm called to do and to be. Does God ever seem far away from you? There are times in our life when the world comes tumbling in on us and we feel crushed and broken. I know that some of us are there right now, and I'm not necessarily talking about that. Because in my experience, my sense of God goes way down. But later, I look back and I'm like, oh, no, no, He was totally there. So if you can't feel Him right now because you're in the middle of a disaster, just hang on. You'll see Him eventually, and it will become clear to you that indeed, He was there in your affliction. But I'm not talking about that. Have you ever been in those times in life? You ever just have your heart run cold? I have. Have you ever found that sin management is becoming harder and harder to do? You know, something maybe that you thought was beaten and overcome and defeated in you wells up with a surprising strength. And you're like, what's this? Why am I this? I I was that 15 years ago. But I haven't been losing my temper this way or I haven't had to fight that hunger for such a long time. Why is this going on in me? Maybe I'm lonely. Or maybe you're afraid to not. Ever been there? Why is it like that? Why why is it that... I mean, if, if the story of the Bible is true... I see a God in that book who just does these amazing things. And He does them again and again and again. And it's so beautiful and amazing. He's so powerful. So why does my spiritual life ebb and flow? Why does it, is it that sometimes it's like a wet weather spring? You know, sometimes the water's there and it's good and it's delightful and wonderful, but why is it that it ever dries up? Have you ever been there? And is there anything that I can do about it? When I go through a season of dryness, I suspect the problem isn't in God. I mean, I think it's likely that God is still just as strong as He ever was. What's going on with me? I think it's why we need to climb the mountain again and again and settle at the foot of our teacher. And when I first came here five years ago, I preached my way through the Sermon on the Mount pretty quick because, honestly, it's my favorite chunk of the Bible. I mean, I'm just drawn to it. I love the discipleship teachings of Jesus. So I've already done this sermon series. Why aren't we doing this again? Because we need it again. And again. And again. I mean, I do. I need to sit at the foot of Jesus Christ I need to hear Him teach me. And I need him, my King to show me His way of reading the law. And I need my King to show me who my God is and how much I can trust Him. I need to climb the mountain and I need to sit with the Lord and hear Him teach His discipleship teachings to me. And so that's why we're running through this again. And in Matthew chapter 6, we've run into that chunk of the Sermon on the Mount that has to do with our spirituality and specifically with spiritual disciplines. Yeah, I asked just a moment ago, is there anything that I can do when my heart runs cold? And the answer is no and yes. I can't light the fire in my own heart. I can't do it. I can't make myself a good man. I can't overcome sin. I can't save myself. And yet, I can be cooperative. You know, I, I can't spiritually change myself, but I can walk together with God on the path of spiritual transformation. This way of the spiritual life, when my heart runs cold, it's meant to make me wake up and go, wait a minute, I've got a problem. I need to be with God more. I need to spend time with God. And my life is not about just sitting around and waiting for Him to change me or fixing myself. It's this cooperative walk with God where I actually engage with Him. I I do things together with Him for the sake of being faithful. 
so that I can remember Him, I can trust Him, and I can draw near to Him. And if He wants to give me a wonderful experience while I'm doing these things, great. But even if He doesn't, even if I don't sense Him there, He is faithful and will bless and mend the heart that comes to Him. So we do these spiritual things, right? They're called spiritual disciplines or spiritual practices or spiritual activity or as Jesus calls them, acts of piety. Things that we do for the purpose of being with God. And you know, we kind of expect those to be kind of mundane and mysterious. That's, that's what they're like, right? I mean, prayer is the most common thing in the world, isn't it? You know, find me a soldier in combat who doesn't have a prayer life. Good luck with that. Atheists pray when they're being shot at. Right? I mean, prayer is, is as common as breathing. It's all over the place. And it's mundane. And it's wondrous. And indescribable, really. And you could stand outside of it and look at it and say, okay, that person, they got in this body posture, they said these things, but, but what went on there? In the unseen realms, prayer is beyond our understanding, categorizing. And that's what we expect spiritual discipline to be like. Mysterious, wondrous, meditation, and and the the times of of worship when when the goosebumps show up. You had those moments? You know, the the time when you you stand someplace in absolute silence and watch the sun rise and just he feels so close and near. You know, and or maybe almost monastic. Weird kinds of things. Like fasting, right? The self-denial kind of activity. We expect Him to talk about those things. And He doesn't disappoint us. He gets to those. But today we look at one that we tend to not classify as a spiritual practice that we are doing to change our hearts. We tend to classify it instead as the fruit of spiritual practice we, if we're doing this, it's because we engaged with God and that's why this is showing up. And that's these acts of charity. Engaging with the poor. Doing something, an act of kindness to the poor. Now, we don't tend to look at that as a spiritual practice at all. That's, that's a duty of a Christian, not an opportunity. We look at prayer, well, honestly, too often we look at all spiritual behavior as a duty and an obligation. I go to worship. Why? Because I have to. I go and listen to that long sermon and have him tell me how awful it is, you know, how awful I am. Yeah. It's a duty. Well, that's a shame because really all spiritual practice is an opportunity to be with God. And what do you have that going that's better than that? He's the very best person you know. And he he actually is willing to spend time with you. That's if you're like me, that's amazing. You know, because I mean I know how interesting I am and how much I deserve his attention. But he's willing to come spend time with me anyway. But we don't look at at giving to the poor as an opportunity to be with God and shape our hearts. We look at it as a responsibility, right? What is he doing? Well, the first thing I would say is that I think when Jesus turns to deal, and I I said this a couple weeks ago, when Jesus turns to deal with spiritual disciplines, He deals with three disciplines, and the reason He does so is because He's in argument with the Pharisees. He's showing a different way of life from what the Pharisees do. And the Pharisees define spiritual piety by three things. Prayer, fasting, and the giving of alms. Okay. You see that in the story of Jesus and the tax collector, or the, rather the, the Pharisee and the tax collector that Jesus tells. The two men who go up to the temple and one of them prays. And when one of them prays, he prays about himself, about how awesome he is, because he fasts twice a week and he gives 10% of his goods to the poor. And what's he doing? He's praying. What a spiritual man. And so Jesus is going to engage with them and say, okay, well, let's, let's deal with what you're doing. Okay, but honestly, this, this same sort of stuff that Jesus teaches can be used to talk about a myriad of different kinds of things. You ever encounter God in your Bible? In the, in the reading of Scripture? And as you read Scripture, God kind of showed up? 
Well, that's a spiritual encounter. That's a spiritual discipline. Of course, most people in the first century couldn't do that because the Bible lived back at the synagogue and they didn't own a copy of it. And so any Bible they had, they'd memorized. That's all they had. So the encounter with God through Scripture is a lot harder. That's why it wasn't one of their chief disciplines. As much as they loved the law, study of the law was the, the behavior of the privileged few, but the masses could pray. And everybody could give to the poor, unless, unless they were poor, and then maybe they'd participate some other way. But So these were the three disciplines that define. And so Jesus is going to talk about these, but the way that He approaches them, folks, we ought to hear and say, okay, well, when I meditate... I should meditate the way that he's teaching me about the discipline of fasting. Or when I work to live in simplicity. Or I spend a day in silence so that I can be with God and not talk. When I do those kinds of things and I'm intentionally opening my heart up to God, here's how I do it. Jesus is teaching us about spirituality. But again, he starts with this weird thing. When you give to the poor, when you give alms, or or when when you give... Charity. I use the word charity there, though, not in, the, not in the, uh, the modern use of the term, but very intentionally in the archaic and ancient one, the ancient English, the old English word charity. If I were to ask you what is a charity, you'd know immediately, right? The United Way, right? The Red Cross, or the Save the Owls Foundation or something. I mean, you can think of a charity. What is a charity? It's an organization that collects money so that it can do good. Maybe the church. If we're not careful, we could think that's what we're for. (laughs) But do you know what the word charity used to mean? And do you know why those organizations came to be assigned to that word? The word charity was the word used in in the past to translate the word agape. So that you had faith, hope, and charity. Right? Acts of charity are these acts where you, you use your resources to love somebody who is in need. That's, that's what the giving is about. It's about being a loving person. Now, how... On earth, I mean, I do that because I know God. How on earth am I doing that so that I can see God? So that I can be open to God? So that I can be present with God? But remember, the, the duty of a king is to interpret the law to people. And I believe that what Jesus is doing here, once again, is He's, he's helping us to understand the will of God and the law of God. Throughout the law, there is this thing called jubilee and the canceling of debts. Throughout the law, there is this thing about being good to the poor and how you'll have no poor among you if you do this. But at the same time, it also, the law will also say there will always be the poor among you. I mean, God knows good and well if you'll do this, but you won't. But you should. And, and if you will, you'll always have an opportunity to do it so that you should give to the poor. In Deuteronomy 15, there's this wonderful passage where it says, now listen, when, when you... When, when the year of Jubilee is approaching, be really careful that you don't have a wicked heart. And you see somebody in need, you harden up your heart and you refuse to lend to that person. And because if, if you do that, because the year of Jubilee is approaching, well, what's the year of Jubilee? It's when the debts are canceled. So if I loan to this person, and next year's Jubilee, they just got to slow walk the repayment, and I don't get it back. I'm not going to do that. He says, you be on your guard against that. Because if you do, then the person who is in need knows that you could help them and you don't. They may cry out to God against you, and God will hear their cry. But instead, you go ahead and incline your heart towards that person. And God will reward you. I think Jesus here is bouncing off that idea, maybe not that specific passage, but that idea that's throughout Deuteronomy. And it shows up in Leviticus. It's all over the will of God to have a heart that is disclosed towards the poor. That's bent towards people who are hurting. And that's saying, I want to be a person who helps the hurting person. Uh, That's the kind of heart I want to have. 
Deuteronomy rebukes the kind of heart that just shuts down and says, I won't do it. But you know, there is a way of doing it that still kind of ignores God and the poor. Jesus will teach us that when we approach a hurting person, we should do it as though we are approaching Him. That Jesus Christ is involved in that moment. So, He's with you, in you, to help you. And whatever good you do for another person, it's really being done by Jesus through you as His servant. But He's also in that other person, in their need. Jesus selects to be part of their need. And so whatever you do that is good for them, you do by Jesus, but you also do for Jesus and with Jesus. And so the giving becomes a moment to be with God. Anytime you see somebody hurting or in need and you can do something about it and you choose to do something about it, you are being with God. And tell the truth, if you've ever done that, I certainly hope you have, was it not amazing? Wasn't it a great feeling? Well, why do you think that was? You suppose there's a pretty amazing presence there? But remember, Jesus is teaching that spiritual discipline can be practiced in such a way that it shuts down the relationship with God and you can lose all of the benefit from it. You can miss out on the reward. You know, and boy, for us Americans who really care about our tangible physical things and our money, wouldn't it be a bummer to give away some of your money and miss the reward? Wouldn't it be better to learn from Him how to do this? So the first thing that he says is when you give alms to the poor, be careful that you don't sound a trumpet before yourself the way that the hypocrites do in the street corners and in the synagogues in order to be seen by people. Why on earth would anybody do that? I mean, to be honest with you, if, if I saw that, I wouldn't go, oh wow, what a great person. I'd go, Gross. Wouldn't you? But, in a way, you've got to throw yourself back into the broken kingdom of God back here in the first century and, and the behavior that, the, that Jesus is critiquing here. Because the people who are doing that, they think they're obeying the law. In fact, they think they're making a big deal about obeying the law and so honoring the law. Right? The law in Deuteronomy that says, don't harden up your heart. Well, not only am I not hardening up my heart, man, I'm going to make a show about it. I'm going to play a trumpet, and maybe I can get some lighting over here, you know, and we can shine that down on me. And let's, let's get a fog machine, and let's, let's make sure that everybody sees it, and everybody knows how wonderful it is. Because, I mean, God's wonderful, and I'm making a wonderful show, and I'm doing a wonderful thing. Let's make a big deal out of it. So that people will admire it, and they'll want to do it too. And won't that be great? Well, if you love the law, I guess. But if you love the poor person, what's that experience like for them? And the person who actually needed something enough that, that they were willing to ask? Have you ever been in a situation where you really needed something, but you weren't willing to ask? Then you know the cost of dignity that it takes you know how bad it hurts to step into a place of humility and humiliation where you are dependent upon the well-being and the largesse of other people. Now play a trumpet near that. How do you feel about that? You see, the person doing this, they love God, <laughs> sort of, but they don't see God in the person that they're caring for. If they did, they would preserve their dignity. They would make sure that that person's embarrassing circumstances were hidden from those around them. Not put on display. And no person would ever become useful to you so that you could show off God or show off your righteousness or show off how... No, that person would remain... Well, I guess what they are, right? person. A person made in the image of God and worthy of love. He says, don't do that. 
Because when you, when you diminish a person, when you make a person into a project, I've actually heard people use that phrase. You know, this is my project. This is my mission. You make a person into your mission, then you've made them not a person. And they're meant to be a person. Interaction with you ought to make them more what they are, not less. You're supposed to be salt. Put on them making them more themselves and better people, not less. You're supposed to be light that brings about the ability to see, not something that distorts and breaks their life. Don't make people projects. Make people people. Love them. Incidentally, what Jesus is talking about here is more than, the, say, the giving to a religious organization. You know, so often I look at what my heart is so cold and wonder, why did, why did my heart run cold? And then I look at what God expects of me and I'm like, well, I don't want my heart to be cold, but I don't want to do that. So we got a third way? And he says, no. There's not. You want your heart to burn hot for God. Love is the way to do it. That's the way through. You be good to somebody else. You find a way to be good. But don't do it this way that's like, hey, look how great I am. Because you do that, you've got your reward in full. If everything that you do is for marketing purposes, look, if you're a marketer, I'm not talking about your job. I'm talking about your spiritual life. If you're showing off in your spiritual life, then you are not doing the thing to be with God. He says that the, the reward you're gonna, you're not going to get reward for that. The only reward is that somebody somewhere might admire you, but a lot of people won't even do that. You're getting everything you're getting out of that. But if you want this to work, if you will, if you want to be with God, hide what you're doing. Don't let anybody know about it. In fact, so much so that you hide it even from yourself. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, what's that about? Well, a moment ago I asked you, have you ever done this and it feels really good? And you know what? You could make being good to other people, giving to other people, about that really good feeling. If you want to. And you'll have your reward in full in that really good feeling. The pursuit isn't about feeling good. The reason we do acts of love and acts of charity, acts of kindness, is so that we can be good to the image of God, so that we can be good to God, so that God can be together with us. That's why we do this. So that our hearts can burn hot with love. So you look for the opportunity to be good to somebody who's hurting. And maybe they're hurting financially and you have finances and you give it to them. But you don't go, Whew, wow, that felt great. I'm so glad I did that. What a great guy I am. No, you say, God, I am your servant and I want to be with you. And I believe that you're here in this place. I believe you're here with this person and I want to be your servant in that place. And I believe that, that by doing this to you, I do this for you. Not, at, not only as your servant, but also as I give to them, I give to you. And you receive it that way. And you outgive me. Because I can give money, you can give hearts. You can give a changed heart. And that's what I want, God. Please, I want my heart on fire. Let me draw near to you. Let me be good so that I can be with you. And he says, don't harden up your heart. Don't say, I gave it the office. Or I gave a church. Look for the way to be good to somebody else. It is, you know, it's so easy to write a check to a charity and never engage in charity. It is so easy to try to do love from a distance. But what Jesus opens up with when he talks about our spiritual life is he says, get close to another person and do it quietly. Be good to them. And if you will, do you know what the most transformative thing of the whole process is? When God loves you through that person. When their love and their gratitude and their welcome into their life comes to you. Those of you who have been 
to, say, Honduras. We went not long ago. And we, and we, we got to interact. Remember Lucy? And her welcome in to her life? What did that do to you? Didn't you encounter God in her? That is the power of this discipline. Where you love another person and you receive love in return and your heart is changed. Because the great reward that you seek from God is not an address in the, in the afterlife. And sure, you have that too. But what would it be like to live in a mansion in heaven with your broken heart? Would it be any good? But you participate with God now in receiving a new heart from Him. And Jesus is calling, hey, here's a way to do it. And if you feel like you're burning cold, find someone to love. If life tumbles in on you, find someone to love. If you're carrying heavy burdens too heavy to bear, find someone to love. Do good to others and God will outpay you in goodness. <laughs> Isn't that worth having? There's a reason we climb the mountain to sit with the Lord. Because He says, your Father who sees what is in secret will reward you. You can't do it to yourself. You can't change yourself. You can't save yourself. You can't transform yourself. But if you want to participate in it, Jesus is saying, okay, Pharisee, here's how. Make love the center of your discipline. You'll be changed. Pursue love, and you'll become a person who loves. <laughs> and guess what you were made to be? That's what you're for. If you look into your heart today and you say, man, I'm not thinking about that. Welcome home. Welcome to the invitation of Christ to come be with Him and loving other people. And, and if you need prayer in order to get here, this stuff's not easy. It's hard to want to do, much less to do. And if you need the prayers of other, well, this church is a praying church. We want to pray for you. And it may be that you came into this place carrying a burden that is too heavy to bear. It has nothing to do with what we talked about today, but, but it's hard. It's heavy. And this church absolutely will pray for you. And if you'll let us, we'll care for you. And if you haven't started following Jesus Christ, Come with us. Come join us. If, if this morning you're subject to the invitation of God, there's room right here. Why don't you come while we stand and sing? There is a place of